So we've reached the final phase in the disassembly and inspection of our 4.0. At this point now we've got, a, we've got the block basically cleaned and we've got to check the bores to make sure that this thing can go as is and it doesn't have to be bored or have any other machine work done to it. But now before I get into any of that, we have to talk about the evolution of engines. And it, it's important at this stage in the game because some of the things we're going to do and some of the things we're going to check on this engine are particular to its generation of engine. And with this series, and this is a whole series, is a playlist. In case you're new to this, there's a whole playlist from the beginning when we pick this thing up as a, as a complete core and we'll continue on to its completion. But there are three generations, three essential generations of engines that have different methods, different ways of working with them. And it's important at this stage of the game that we clarify what they are because I don't know what you're working on and we're trying to make this fit every, you know, it's your first engine job. So we're trying to make this one video series fit all of these different types of engines. So let's break them down like this. You got three generations. You've got your primitive engines, You've got your intermediate engines, and this is an example of that, and you've got your modern high-tech engines. So the essential difference in these, in these engines is the amount of precision built into them. So for example, if you take your earliest internal combustion engines from the 1900 to let's say 1940s, those things were crude, I mean really crude. They were intended to be serviced by the average person. If you, you know, you're going to wrap your head around that for a minute, but like the typical mechanic of the day would pour his own bearings and do all of these things with, without any real machine work, without any real precision. They were intended to be used more or less for the lack of, lack of better, uh, better explanation, or lack of a better term. They were, they were like for farm use, you know, even though they were regular cars. But the idea was you know, a farmer could pull this thing apart in his shed, re-ring it, throw bearings in it, head gasket, decarbon it, whatever, and send it back on the road. Those engines from that era operated at very low RPM. They didn't cover much distance. You know, 40 or 50,000 miles was a lot for a car back then. They didn't have interstates. And so the machinery reflected that. They had big, heavy pistons. They had big, gawky rings. They, they were like things like bore tapers, like what's that? It didn't matter. It didn't make any difference. These engines chugged along at two, 3,000 RPM. They made 40 horsepower, 50 horsepower. They ran on primitive oils. And actually, the, the sludge that would build up in those engines helped to seal them, right? It, it, was, it was a completely different era. Then you get to the, the 1950s, 60s, 70s. And those engines, those intermediate engines, and the Jeep 4 liter is, a, is an example of that. And pretty much every engine we work with is an example of that, that era. Those engines, they came about post-interstate, where the engine was required to, to run 100, 150, 200,000 miles without major service. At highway speeds, they, they would have to run all day at 3,000, 4,000 RPM. Tolerances got tighter, materials got better, and they required a little more sophistication than the earlier farm implement type of engines did. So that's where we're at with this. And when we make our measurements and we, we use our terms, this is the type of engine that we're generally referring to. But now, let's say you're working with something that's newer, something from the modern era. Those engines have much tighter clearances, much tighter tolerances. They use low tension rings. They have uh, very tight specifications. Like for instance, you take a primitive engine, and we're talking about bore taper, right? Bore taper is a difference in diameter from the top of the bore to the bottom of the bore, or any variation in between. So those earlier engines, low RPM, big, thick, cast iron rings, they expand and contract, the piston went up and down, and it, and it was like, whatever, right? Then you get to engines from this era, and it's like suddenly bore taper does make a difference because when things got operated 3,000 or 4,000 RPM and make power and, and survive, well, now that becomes a little bit more critical and there's an actual dimension because at that speed, the ring can't expand and contract fast enough at high RPM to make up for bore taper, so that becomes an issue. And then you get to the modern engines with, with the lightweight stainless rings, light tension, thin stainless rings. 
almost no bore taper at all is is acceptable with those engines because those rings like I said they're low tension and they will not hug a cylinder wall they'll just easily yield to a film of oil and contract and now the thing doesn't seal so these engines that we generally deal with especially on this channel these 1960s and 70s Chrysler engines and stuff like this Jeep these things are relatively sloppy so I guess if you're building on if you're working on if you're if the engine that you're working on especially if it fits into the more modern era it's it's important that you stick to the specifications don't take the the newer the engine the higher tech the engine the less uh, the less breathing room you have so just keep that in mind as we're going forward like we're trying to paint we're trying to do all of these engines or like, like just to make it a generic your first engine job and we're trying to cover all of these different types of engines using this thing as an example so just keep that in mind whatever you're working on you need to know you have to have all of the specifications for that engine all of the tolerances have to be you have to know what they are you have to be able to measure these things and and, and stick with them or you'll have a, a really sloppy project and by the same token if you try to apply modern tolerances and modern technology to a really old thing, you know, you build a 1928 Studebaker or whatever it is, you're not going to find any really benefits upgrading the, the or, or, or keeping the Studebaker motor surgically clean and everything to the one one hundred thousandth of an inch. So you have to use your judgment and you have to know what you're working with. So that was, that was a rant, right? Okay. So let's talk about this thing now. We, um, when we tore it apart, we, f we found that only the number one cylinder showed any signs of distress. Our number six cylinder is the one that had the cracked skirt, but number one was bringing in water and it, had, it, was, it was messy looking. So we did a quick hone job on this, and we'll talk about the hone in a second. And this really looks a lot better than I expected it to. It looks like we're going to be able to just clean this thing up with a hone and, and call it a day. The rest of the cylinders have very obvious crosshatch still on them. It's a faint crosshatch, but it's there. So I'm confident we'll be fine with these other cylinders. None of them have any deep gouges or scratches or anything like that. So we did a quick cleanup hone on this one cylinder. Let's talk about homes. I did a whole video. We did a whole video. On honing for the home engine builder it's it you could search it it's on our, our channel and we talked about the reasons the, the, the main reasons why you would want to use a fixed stone or a fixed leg hone as opposed to a dingleberry hone so this is a fixed stone hone right you can buy the glaze breaker you can, like, a lot of people call them glaze breakers you get these at like to any auto parts store this is the type you want to use for this a dingleberry hone has its place its place is generally an engine that you know has straight, smooth cylinder walls. And let's say you're going to re-ring it. Perfect example is like a race engine. You've got 100 passes on it and you want to re-ring it or you're going to change the pistons out or whatever. And you just want to put a fresh cross hatch on the bore. Well, that's what you'd use a dingleberry for. For this purpose, you definitely don't want to use a dingleberry because it the dingleberry won't allow the imperfections in the cylinder wall to show up. Only the straight edge from, from that type of hone will make an even cut all the way around so that you can see high spots and low spots. Where the dingleberry, because each dingleberry is free to float on its own, will just fill in those marks and you won't see what you're getting at. So that's why if you're going to do this, you do it with a, a, a straight leg hone, a fixed stone hone, whatever you want to call it. That type of home. One other thing too, at this stage, you're not trying to get a finish hone on this thing. You're just trying to determine whether or not this block is going to have to be sent out to a machine shop and be bored. So if you have old stones on your hone, now's the time you want to use them because you want to keep the nice clean ones when you do your final honing for the, for the fresh rings. So if you've got old ones, now's the time to use them. Now we did this cylinder. Yeah, come here. Let's uh, let's get a look at this. So, the main part of 
the solar that we're concerned with is about from where my finger is, which is where the bottom of the oil rings, oil rings are going to run to, to this line right here, this faint line. And that's where the top ring stops. So it's this area you're concerned with. Anything below this, if there's gouges, chips, anything like that missing below the, the mark where the bottom oil ring rides, don't worry about it. It's inconsequential. It's this section right here. All right, so what you can see up here on the top of the cylinder is this little bit of a ridge. Now, on this engine here, this is it's really inconsequential. You can barely feel it. Now, in the old days, and now we go back to talking about primitive engines versus more modern engines. In the old days, those ridges used to get so bad that you actually couldn't knock the pistons out. The rings would get caught on there. And they would sell a thing called a ridge reamer, which you would literally cut that ridge away so the piston would come out. On this engine, this line is so faint, it's, it's, I can't catch my finger on it. It's just, it's just a little bit of a shadow that's there, and that's a normal thing. Some of them are a little bit more than that. Now, the general rule of thumb is that if you can catch your finger on it, it needs to be bored. On this one, I really can't catch my finger on it. I'm not going to stress it. This is going to be fine. As far as the Ridge Reamer goes, I, I've never used one. I mean, all the engines I've ever done, 45 years, I've never used one. couple of reasons. The first is that if you are going to hone this cylinder, by cutting this ridge away, you're reducing the, the, the true surface that the, hone, that the stones have to work with. Like, for instance, now, this, is, this very top part of the cylinder here is the only true, original, untouched part of the bore because the rings never run up in there, so there's zero wear there. That is the trueness of the bore. If you cut this away just to get rid of that ridge, you're, you're getting rid of the only part, the only true part of the entire cylinder. So when we hone this thing, what we're doing is we're using the top part of it as a guide, but you would cut away with the ridge reamer. That's actually the top guide to the stone. And then when you go to the bottom, you're working off the part of the cylinder that the rings never touch, that let's say the skirts of the piston touch. And that's another true part of the bore. So when you're honing with a fixed stone hone like that one, you're bridging this true mark or this true area with the bottom true area. And everything in the middle is going to contour to those two areas. So that's why you, you don't want to use a ridge reamer. I guess that's, that's, that's way ancient technology. That's for engines that, that were built in the 1930s, 1940s, that type of thing. There's, there's no place, if you've, if you've got that much of a ridge, bore it. That's it, done. Just have, send this thing out and have a board. Now, we have to make a couple of checks on this. And again, like I said, these other cylinders, I have no question about their condition. I'm, I'll check them anyway. I'll do a spot check on them, but I know they're going to be fine. Just visually, I can see the crosshatch. This one here didn't have a crosshatch. It does now because I honed one into it. And I, this, is, this isn't a final hone. This is only honed so that I can make my measurements, so I can check what I've got here. So the first thing you want to do is you want to check for bore roundness, okay? We do that with a ring. Now, of course, there are tools to measure this. I'm assuming that because this is your first engine job, you don't have those tools. So I'll show you how to do it without the tools. So what you need is a ring. First, you, you give it a quick hone, just like, just like we've got over here. Don't go crazy with it. You just want to clean the, the carbon and oil and anything else, sludge that might be built up on a cylinder. You just want to get that clean. And then you want to take one of the rings from the engine and make sure that it doesn't have any gouges or scrapes or anything on it, okay? Now, what you do is you stick the ring in the cylinder, okay? Take a piston and square the ring. Go down about, go down to right about where the, where the ring sits when the piston's at the top of its stroke, right about there. And then you take a light. And we're going to shine the light up from the bottom of the bore. And we're going to look around the outside of the ring to see if, we, if there's any light between the ring and the cylinder. And we don't see anything. So now 
Let's knock it down. Inch or so. Check it again. And again, we're good here. We don't see any light anywhere between the ring and the cylinder wall. I'll knock it down a little more. Now it's important to check this in a few areas because the cylinder might have a section in the middle where it's kind of like um, hourglass shaped or where it's, it's just distorted. The very top of the bore and the very bottom of the bore are generally going to be true because they're anchored by the deck and the bottom structure of the block. But the center of the liner is kind of freestanding, so that's really where you want to make your checks. And here we go here, and this is fine. And we're going to just go a little bit further down to where the oil, the, the oil ring sits at the bottom of the stroke, which is right about there. And that's it. We're good. So we know now that this cylinder is round. Like I said, there are tools to check this with. But I'm assuming this is your first engine job. This is the way you can do it with no tools. All right. So now we want to check taper, bore taper. And again, ways to, you know, there are tools to check this with. We'll show you how to do it with a ring. So bore taper is where the bore starts out, let's say, wide and ends up narrow, or vice versa, or it has like an hourglass shape in the center, which is not uncommon. It'll bulge in the center, or it could suck in in the center, but this is how you check this. So the first thing you do is you take the ring. Now remember, this is an old ring, so we're not concerned with what the actual gap is, because we're assuming it's going to be worn. But what we are concerned is what the gap it currently has is. So for this, you set the ring up at the very top of the cylinder, that uncut area that's connected to the deck. And you know that this is going to be round. This is, this is going to be perfectly true. And you take a feeler gauge. I'm just doing this to, for demonstration purposes here. So you take a feeler gauge and you, you check the gap. You set the, the feeler gauge to whatever this gap happens to be. Now, knock the ring down about yay far and check the gap again. And here our, our gap is staying consistent. Now I go about an inch down from there. Check it again. Okay. And we'll go to the bottom to where the oil ring would stop. And, and we got a consistent gap there. So we know based on what that gap is as it travels down the cylinder that there is no taper on this cylinder. That's not to say that the other ones don't have it, we'll have to check that. But this cylinder has no taper. This thing is good to go. Now, this is why it's important to know the specifications of your engine. These things used very heavy, very springy cast rings. And those rings in the operating range, the RPM range that these engines operated in, those, those rings had enough spring to actually compensate for a great deal of bore taper. A modern engine with low tension stainless rings, you can't get away with any bore taper. So where on this engine, which uses a cast ring, on this engine, if let's say I found there was three thousandths, four thousandths of an inch bore taper, it's gonna be, it's gonna be okay. I may hone it, I may try to do some corrective honing on it to even the cylinder out, which you can do with that type of hone. But again, if you're, using a, you're dealing with a modern engine, it's like there's no tolerance for it. I think I covered everything I wanted to cover with this. Um, honing, I use, I use gasoline. I've been honing engines for 45 years. I've used everything that there is. You can use, 
You can use uh, uh, transmission fluid, brake fluid, uh, light oils like WD-40 or PB Blast or anything like that. There's so many different concoctions that you can hone an engine with. And I've honed with all of them at one time or another. But gasoline is my go-to with this. People freak out. It's like, oh, you're going to blow yourself up. Everything's going to like that. I have never, ever once, in hundreds of engines that I've honed over the years, I have never once had a fire or an incident with that. I like using the gasoline because it cuts quickly, it cuts cleanly, it cleans as it's cutting, and it, it's easy to wash out the, the residue at the bottom of the engine, because there's always residue at the bottom of the engine. So that's what I use gasoline for honing these things. You know, use whatever you feel comfortable with. If you've never done it before, I suggest you do it outside. Right, but that's it for that. Um, what else did I want to talk about? I think that's it. Oh, I do want to talk about measuring how to measure pistons and, and skirt clearance and all of that. And we will do that in the, the installment when we go to put this thing back together again. We have the pistons in it. But at this stage of the game, I can confidently order a set of standard bore pistons and, no, and, and standard rings and know that this engine is going to go together fine. I think that's about it, and uh, I'll see you tomorrow.